Bedouin Press presents 7 and 7, a globe-hopping memoir of disaster and discovery. Written by Sven Michael Davison and performed by Sven Michael Davison. Continent 5, Antarctica, December 2nd through 22nd, 2006. I stepped into my cabin and found two Swedes standing there. One was a gentleman of 62 named Einar, whose white hair was trimmed in a buzz cut. The other gentleman was 51-year-old Casper. They were both fit and wearing winter gear. I spotted a Sven Davison name tag on the top bunk. Casper walked up to me with his hand extended and addressed me in Swedish. I shook Casper's hand. Sorry, but I'm not Swedish. Puzzlement twisted on Casper's face. He responded in English with a slight Swedish accent. What about your parents? Nope. Not parents, not grandparents, nobody. It was the 60s and my parents were having a good time. He gave me a blank stare. Einar and Casper were friends by way of Einar's second wife, Dagmar, and had taken many trips together. In order to save money on the fare for this trip, Einar and Casper had booked themselves as singles willing to share a triple berth. Dagmar, who also came on the trip, had done the same. She was sharing the cabin next door. The triple berth was a tight space, but I didn't mind meeting new people and booking into a triple represented a $2,000 savings. The bigger drawback was that there was no bathroom in the cabin. We had toilets and showers down the hall at midships. But all of this was more than acceptable because I was going to see Antarctica. Our passage was expensive because our ship, a Russian research vessel built for Arctic exploration, had a maximum passenger capacity of 48 in addition to its crew of 30. Her name was the Professor Molshanov. Her crew was Russian, but Quark, the tour company managing this voyage, and the hospitality crew, was Swedish. During the Northern Hemisphere's winters, the Professor Molshanov toured Antarctica. In the Northern Hemisphere's summer, she toured the North Pole. What excited me most about this trip was its shadowing of Ernest Shackleton's second and most famous journey to the White Continent. Shackleton had set sail in 1914, planning to cross the entire Antarctic on foot. His ship, Endurance, wound up locked in Antarctic sea ice, and he had to abandon ship with his men and set out on the ice in order to survive. The crew converted their three lifeboats into sleds, and when the ice ran out, they changed the sleds back into boats. They wound up on Elephant Island, quite a ways from civilization, during the dead of southern winter. Shackleton fashioned one of the lifeboats into a sailboat and set out with three crew members to find help. The remaining crew was stranded on Elephant Island with nothing more than Shackleton's promise to return as their hope for rescue. Shackleton sailed north in rough seas and landed on South Georgia Island, populated by whalers. He and his men had to drive nails through the soles of their shoes and climb the mountains of South Georgia Island in order to reach the whaling town of Stromness on the opposite shore. After finding civilization once again, it took Shackleton another three months to convince a ship and crew to sail down to Elephant Island and rescue his remaining men. Chile finally sponsored a trip, and every one of Shackleton's crew was rescued in 1916. The Professor Molshanov would be following Shackleton's trail in December, Antarctica's summer, so conditions would not be anywhere near as harsh as they had been in 1916. Nevertheless, I was excited to be following the explorer's footsteps almost a hundred years later. In addition, we would all be setting foot on the white continent itself, and I fully intended to get on my knees and kiss the ground when we got there. Antarctica was still a rare place to visit for most on this planet. As a believer in climate change, I felt the white continent would be drastically altered during my lifetime. It was also the last land frontier on our planet. For all of these reasons, I longed to experience it. Welcome aboard the Professor Molshanov. The voice of our Swedish cruise director, Gunnar, boomed through the ship's PA system. His American accented English was flawless. Gunnar was five foot ten, and he had a blonde crew cut to match his blonde twelve o'clock shadow. He ran the hospitality team with confidence and authority. Please take this time to get settled and find your life jackets and join us at 1400 for a lifeboat briefing. We all did as we were told. Unlike on most cruise ships, we not only discussed the lifeboat drill, we entered the lifeboats to experience what it would be like. After all, in spite of all the technology that humans had invented since Shackleton's time, this was still potentially a very dangerous trip. The space within the lifeboat was very cramped, and I had inadvisably chosen a seat that had a pipe overhead. I had to cock my head at an angle to accommodate it. I could not imagine being in this tight spot for several days in rough seas. The crew closed the lifeboat hatch and turned on the engine to give us a taste of real travel in the thing. 
It was dark and crowded, and the sound of the motor combined with the crankshaft spinning under the hull was deafening. After our lifeboat briefing, the Professor Molshanov cruised out of Argentina's Ushuaia Harbor. Our heading was a side trip to the Falkland Islands, or the Malvinas, as they are called in Argentina. We had an Argentine national named Emilio on board, who was part of our hospitality crew, our resident historian and Zodiac inflatable driver. Why do all the maps in Argentina include the Antarctic Peninsula as well as the Falkland Islands as part of the country? I asked Emilio. Argentina laid claim to both in the 1800s. The Antarctic Treaty, signed in the 1950s, keeps us from taking the peninsula, and the American and British navies keep us from taking the Falklands. But every Argentine child is taught of our national claim when they attend school. The government encourages it, and that's why you see it reinforced on our maps. If you're interested, I'm giving two lectures on the Falklands during the trip. I'll be there, I said. Part of my journey to Ushuaia had included taking a red eye from Miami to Buenos Aires, on which I had sat next to an Argentinian named Luis. Luis was very interested in my Antarctic itinerary, but even more curious about the Falklands. Since the war of 1982, the British government has only allowed two Argentinian civilian ships to visit the graves of the dead soldiers, Luis informed me. An Argentine film was just recently released about the war and its aftermath. But it was shot in Argentina because the British would not allow an Argentinian production to set foot on the islands. Are there any Argentinian nationals on the islands now? I believe there are descendants of the Argentines who lived there before the English colonization. Once I become a citizen, I hope to use my new American passport to see the Falklands. At dinner time that night, I went down to the dining room and sat at a table on the port side of the ship. Because our vessel was so small, the room looked more like a narrow cafeteria or break room located in a factory. White tablecloths were placed over the pressboard tables bolted to the walls and floor, which helped take the utilitarian edge off the room. I sat across from Kara, a white-haired woman in her late sixties who was very pale and built like a brick oven. I started up a conversation with her. Kara had a graveled voice, and she spoke with authority. Everyone tells me how lucky I am to travel, but luck has nothing to do with it. I worked hard for my travel. I was a dancer in my day, but that's hard work with little monetary reward, so I quickly got an accounting degree. I worked weekdays and weekends, day and night. Accounting paid for my lifestyle while I continued my dancing, and it also allowed me to travel. I've been everywhere. I've got a lifestyle similar to that. She waved her hand. You have no idea. Do you want a house? No, but I'm saving up to buy one. Secretly, I was living far below my means and saving up to buy a modest place in a less expensive state. The plan was to drastically reduce my overhead, take a less demanding job, and work on the stories I wanted to write. Kara rolled her eyes. I hate houses. Everyone should have an apartment. I have a doorman who keeps solicitors out, and I live on Central Park West. There's no better place to live on the earth than Central Park West, except maybe the French Riviera. With an apartment, I can leave for months and not worry about a thing. I had a house, and it was more trouble than it was worth. Our main course of filet mignon had come, and I dove into it. Any kids? Never saw point, Kara grunted. Kids are the worst financial decision you can make in life. Plus, they're a whole lot of work, and when they grow up, they don't want to have anything to do with you. Married? What's the point? Marriage just ruins things. Better to have a partnership where you can see each other a few times a week. People in a healthy relationship have separate homes and lives, so they never get on each other's nerves. She glanced at my left hand. No ring. You dating anyone? I suddenly thought of Bianca, the blonde Southern California girl I had been seeing for the past six months. I had met her online, and, as in many of my past relationships, we had chemistry but little else. Just broke up with someone the night before this trip. You cheat on her? She may have been cheating on me. I don't know. Let's just say it didn't work out. Kara spent the rest of the conversation pumping me about my dating life, and I was feeling more and more like escaping. She struck me as a very sad and lonely person. Her prickly defenses would be tough for anyone to navigate. After I had finished my meal, I excused myself and headed back to my room. I checked my supply of seasickness pills and fell asleep dreaming of adventures as one of Shackleton's crew. I spent our first full day at sea exploring the ship and attending the three lectures our hospitality crew offered. Since we were on a research vessel, there were no frills. The only common rooms were the galley and the bar. The rest of the ship was purely functional. Happily, though, we were allowed on the bridge any time we liked. 
so many of us would sit and watch one of two radar screens for ice. So far, the journey was exactly the way I wanted it. I had no interest in being reminded of home. I wanted to feel like I was an explorer. My social life was fairly dead due to my all-consuming job. I was upset over the breakup with Bianca, and I was tired of looking at dry, dusty Los Angeles. I desperately needed a change. Of the three lectures that day, my favorite was the one on birds given by Bruce, our very tall, gangly, and bearded ornithologist. Bruce's love and fascination with birds was expressed through an exuberance of manner that was infectious to all. Bruce had been working in Antarctica for the past 12 years, mostly as a cook at several bases and on icebreakers. He had even lived in Port Stanley, the capital of the Falklands, for a year. Six years before, Bruce had landed a job monitoring elephant seals at a research station. The base leader, impressed by Bruce's slideshows and knowledge of birds, recommended Bruce to Quark, and he'd been working for Quark ever since. Zara, our onboard geologist, gave a lecture on plate tectonics, Pangaea, and subsequent supercontinents. Zara was short, in her late 40s, and had a buzz cut and glasses. Her girlfriend was traveling as the onboard videographer. I found most of the crew had long-distance relationships with others in the same field. As cliché as it sounds, it made me think that love and understanding made anything possible. As promised, Emilio provided our last lecture on the colonization of the Falklands. Basically, throughout the 1600s and 1700s, Spain, Portugal, Britain, France, and the Netherlands all laid vague, competing claims to the islands during an era when such empire-building countries were sailing around the world and claiming any scrap of land they found as part of their sovereign nation. But after many decades of diplomatic shenanigans and fort building, by the 1800s, only sealers and whalers lived on the Falklands. There was no official government presence of any kind. In 1820, the newly independent Argentina, known then as Rio de la Plata, claimed the Falklands as its territory. Five years later, Britain recognized Argentina's independence, and in 1828, Argentina established a settlement in the Falklands. In spite of this, a series of skirmishes with Britain and the U.S. continued until 1833, when Argentinian gauchos killed several British nationals. Britain retaliated by sending in troops, killing the Argentinian inhabitants, and populating the islands in earnest with British citizens. They undertook the development of the harbors and all the industry in and around the Falklands. In Argentina, it was commonly taught that there were two types of people living in the Falklands, the minority being English landowners, and an oppressed majority being Argentinian servants who had no rights. But Emilio had been to the Falklands, and he declared this depiction to be pure propaganda created to fuel animosity towards England, thus distracting the Argentinian population from its domestic problems, mainly a corrupt government. I was looking forward to visiting and making my own evaluation. That night, we all gathered at the bar for the day's recap when Gunner read off all the animals that had been spotted by the passengers and crew. Tonight we'll reach the Falklands. We'll make our first landing at South Harbor at 5 o'clock in the morning. Wake-up call will be 4.30. The room was silent. Those of you who don't want to go are welcome to sleep in. I could tell by the mumblings around me that despite the early start, most were excited to hit the beaches. It's also tradition, Gunner continued, on days that we make landfall, that someone takes the weather, meaning one of you volunteers to give a weather prediction for tomorrow. If you're close, you get a free drink at the bar. Most everyone cheered. Who's our first volunteer? Zara, our resident geologist, raised her hand. I predict sunshine. Everyone applauded. Zara predicts sunshine. Someone write that down. We'll rate Zara's prediction during tomorrow's recap. The next morning, Gunner's voice came over the ship's PA. Good morning, everyone. It's 4.30 in the morning, and we are now anchored inside South Harbor on New Island, one of two islands we will be visiting in the Falklands today. We'll begin our landing at 5 o'clock. Please meet us on the deck if you plan to join. My internal clock had been out of whack since L.A., so the time was inconsequential. I dressed, turned my tag, a system to let the crew know you're off the ship, and was on deck ten minutes after Gunner's wake-up call. The sky above was dark blue. The sun was close to the horizon, but not above it yet. The gangway was down, and I lined up next to Bruce. I see an early bird, too, he said. I like getting up early. I feel I get more of a day that way. He nodded in agreement. I'm usually the first of the quark guides to be on deck waiting for the Zodiacs to be dropped. The quark crew always goes to shore first, usually with Gunnar driving. We bring three coolers with emergency supplies in them. Gunnar scouts for the most open spot on shore that will have the lowest impact on wildlife. 
We beach the boat, unload the coolers, and then radio for you passengers to come over. You've got it down to a science. We try. As promised, Bruce soon left with Gunner and the team, and I saw them head over to the black beach of New Island. About ten minutes later, I was aboard a Zodiac with eleven other passengers shooting towards shore. The loud roar of the outboard motor, the rushing wind, and the pre-dawn sky above the deserted landmass made me feel like I was part of some massive military operation. I began to sing Wagner's Ride of the Valkyries. Oscar, a tall poet from Pennsylvania and fellow passenger, smiled at me. Gunner met our boat and pulled us to shore. Everyone slide off and gather round for instructions before you proceed. I dropped into ankle-high water, but thanks to my ship-issued galoshes, my feet did not get wet. Do not touch any animal. If one touches you, that is fine, but do not interfere with the animals. Take nothing, leave nothing. What we bring in, we take out. This also applies to bathroom breaks. If you need to go, come back here and someone will return you to the ship. Understood? We all gave the affirmative. Great. Have fun and we'll see you in two hours. Bruce stepped in. There's a Magellan penguin rookery up this ridge if anyone's interested. We all hoofed it up the ridge to a two-track dirt road where many Magellans ducked and waddled down burrows built between tufts of tussock grass. The mostly black penguins had white chests and a white C curving from their forehead down under their chin. A patch of pink skin sat above their eyes instead of feathers. I never knew penguins burrowed. The path led to the opposite side of the ridge, and people shuffled along it at their own pace. I wound up hiking next to a fellow passenger in his late sixties named Hubert, a Brit who had sold his company twenty years before and had been traveling the world ever since. He was tall, fit, and had close-cropped white hair. I had a friend who fought in the Falklands War, Hubert said. The RAF would fly over these islands and see the penguins looking up at them. We reached a ridge, and the sun broke over the ocean. The tussock grass seemed to burn with gold and amber hues. Hubert continued, I'm going to hike the hills my friend fought on when we reach Port Stanley tomorrow. Our first stop was a bluff where black-browed albatross nested. These birds have an average wingspan of over six feet. When we arrived, some birds were sitting on their massive nests, tire-sized layer cakes of mud and feathers. Other albatrosses were busy swooping in for landings or taking off on the wind blowing up the cliff face. One flew so close to my head it felt like a small aircraft had just buzzed me. There were not many passengers left at the albatross nest site when I began to hike up another ridge. Reaching the top, I looked around the hilly landscape and noticed the Molshanov partly moving farther east. I followed the crowd and reached a large grassy hill where a group of Gentoo penguins were nesting with a pair of kings. I continued down a long, gentle slope to a beach below, passing a tiny one-room cabin for scientists to observe wildlife. As I walked along, I wondered if we'd run into the owners of the island, Tony Chatter and Ian Strange. Like everyone I met who lived on or around the White Continent, Tony and Ian were conservationists who took only what they needed from the land. Every place we made landfall was undeveloped, and this made me happy. The world needed more resorts and commercial enterprises like I needed a bullet in the head. Once back aboard the Molshanov, we had to scrub our boots with disinfectant to kill all the germs that are in bird guano. While we ate breakfast in the galley, the captain moved the Molshanov to Ship's Harbor, located on New Island. Ship's Harbor contained two shipwrecks and a single family settlement. We cruised onto the beach in black zodiacs. A white-haired gentleman in orange flannel and jeans met us on the beach. I was surprised to learn that this was none other than Tony Chatter, whose family lived at the settlement. I started a conversation with Tony and his wife, Kim. I came here from England when I was captain of a merchant ship back in the 70s, Tony informed me. I saved up enough money to buy New Island from its previous owner. Back in the 80s and 90s, I also owned and operated a few stores in Stanley. But I recently sold off all my interests. I now lease this settlement from Ian. Kim and I are planning on moving when our eldest son is ten. What's the significance of ten, I asked. Kim chimed in with her decidedly American accent. That's when the government says you can no longer homeschool. All children must go to school in Stanley. If you don't live there, the kids are boarded. What attracts you to live here? I asked. Tony responded, It's simple, honest, a frontier like the new world was a couple hundred years ago. I came for Tony, Kim smiled. How did you two meet? As we talked, I kept eyeing a greenhouse built on the settlement next to a structure made out of whale jawbones. I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, 
After college, I worked on cruise ships, and one of my routes brought me down here. I met Tony when we came into port. When was the last time you were in Phoenix? Can't be an easy flight from here. No, you wind up with several legs in between. I haven't been back in two years, but my parents have been out twice since the last time I was back. Kim introduced me to her boys and then gave me a tour of some of the whalebone structures around the property and the hothouse. It all felt like I'd stepped back in time 150 years to visit frontier settlers. On my way back down to the Zodiacs, I found Tony selling first-day covers of Falkland Island stamps. He had designed all the stamps himself, and the government had approved the designs. I bought a set from him. I thought it was pretty cool to have your art on the front of a stamp. Following lunch, the Mulshanov weighed anchor off the coast of Carcass Island, where we were scheduled for a brief hike before high tea with the island's owner, Rob and Lorraine McGill. After an hour's walk, I reached the McGill settlement. Like the chatters on New Island, the McGills were the only people who lived on all of Carcass Island. I wonder what it would be like to grow up in this type of environment. On my way to the McGill house, I walked past an old rusty boat and farm machinery. The home itself looked like it had been built in the 70s. It was my understanding that the McGills and the Chatters made a modest income from the periodic tours, plus it allowed their children to see a bit of civilization out of their isolated lives. I took off my boots and went into the house. The McGills had a four-foot by twelve-foot table covered in homemade cookies and sweets. I tried one of everything and wound up consuming twenty-five cookies. As I made a pig of myself, I overheard Mr. McGill and Gunner chatting. If you need anything, I'll bring it next time, Gunner said. We'll be back in a couple of months. I'm okay, Mr. McGill replied in his English accent. One of my fellow passengers lobbed a question at Mr. McGill. How did you wind up with this place? I started out as a merchant marine, and I worked my way up to captain. Then I had a bout in real estate selling islands here. The population has always been low, so buying and selling entire islands is not that odd. But that's changing. My wife and I saw a carcass and decided to buy it and settle here. I've owned it since 1977. I exited the house and walked down to the beach where Gunner and team had parked the Black Zodiacs. A natural rock jetty stretched into the bay, creating a barrier between the open ocean and the shallow water near the McGill home. Three chubby boys, the McGill children, observed the behavior of the Moshanov passengers with the same fascination we evinced for the wildlife of their island. I waved to the boys, and they waved back. Wearing my rubber boots and waterproof Arcturix pants, I waded into the shallow bay. I went out a dozen yards before the calm water came up to my knees. I put up my hand in the water, and it didn't seem much colder than the Pacific around Los Angeles. A simple life, man against the elements, an island for me and my family. How romantically tempting. Maybe I should be looking at real estate down here. That night, during the recap, Zara won a drink for her perfect prediction of sunny weather. Stan, a six-foot-ten Australian from Perth, stood up. I predict... Another sunny day. The bar erupted in cheers. I had dinner with Stan, his wife Fabia, and Hubert, the older Englishman I had hiked with that morning. I've visited over 58 countries in the past 20 years, Hubert explained to us. Our problem is not the supply of natural resources, it's population control. Back in the 70s, that's all we talked about. He looked directly at me for his next statement. But now it's all about abolishing abortion. I say we make a plan to take care of those who are alive and stop breeding like we have the infant mortality of the Middle Ages. You want resources? Reduce the human population. Stan raised his wine glass. This from a man who already has a daughter. The next morning was gray and overcast as a Molshanov cruised into Port Stanley. I stood on deck to watch our approach. I could see the entire town from the bow of the ship. Stanley could have been any European town. There were brick row houses with brightly colored roofs in red, blue, yellow, and green. I searched for some type of ghetto where subjugated Argentines might live, but I saw no such place. Our ship pulled up to a dock, and we walked down a gangway onto a wooden avenue. Dressed in rain gear, we all went our separate ways. Since most people were headed into town, I navigated towards the cemetery where I walked solo among the graves in the quiet drizzle. I am not social by nature, and I needed to be alone with my thoughts for a while. Many headstones were from the 19th century. I meandered over to the forest for the fallen soldiers. The people of the islands had planted a tree for each person who had died fighting Argentina in the Falklands War. Every tree had a small plaque with a fallen soldier's name on it. After having my fill of alone time, I headed back toward town, 
passing by the police station and post office. It all felt very British, down to the greenish hills under the drizzling sky. I remembered what Emilio had told me after his lecture. Like most Argentines, he had grown up believing that the Falklands were full of his countrymen being oppressed by the British. And when he finally visited them, he was amazed by how English they were. There wasn't a hint of Latin America here. But now there was an economic angle to Argentina's argument for taking the islands back. Geologists had discovered oil deposits off the Falkland coast. Plus, there were lucrative squid fishing licenses that were sold every year to boats that wanted to work the Falklands' sovereign waters. I smelled another conflict in the future. I walked west past the offices of the Penguin News, the Falklands' only newspaper. The press was inside a building no larger than a double-wide trailer. Drizzle turned to heavy rain. I continued onward and then cut down to a bayside path. Here I discovered the wreck of the Jellum, an 1840s bark, the last of her kind. A shoreside plaque gave a brief history of the ship. After her retirement, the locals had used the Jellum as a pub until the 1930s. Today she was an abandoned hulk, being slowly devoured by time and the sea. In all, there were 14 wrecks in the bay, each with a plaque like this one. I admired the Falklanders' solution to old sunken hulks. Every bay has them, but they are immediately removed for safety reasons at great cost to the local government. Wandering further west, I walked up a hill toward the Falkland Museum, where I learned about a private plane that had landed in the Falklands in the mid-1960s. The Argentine pilot and two of his friends ran out and planted a flag in the ground and claimed the Falklands for Argentina. When they were arrested, they said they had been thrown off course and decided to plant the flag as a joke. As a response, the government sent them home and cut their plane into scrap metal. Then, in 1967, an Aerolinus, an Argentine airline plane, was hijacked and forced to land in the Falklands. Terrorists held the passengers hostage and demanded that the Falklands be given back to Argentina. A Catholic priest from Chile was sent in to negotiate between the Falkland government and the terrorists. Eventually, the terrorists gave up. As I walked through the museum, I was struck by the determination of some Argentinians to reclaim possession of a place that seemed to have very little to do with Argentina itself. Someday the Falklands may be recognized as the Malvinas by the entire world. If that happens, I imagine the majority of islanders will move to England and be most unhappy there. All the natives had a unique frontier type of lifestyle. There is no other place quite like it on Earth. We were all back aboard the Molshanov by lunchtime. The only animal I had hoped to photograph during our stopover was the Falkland flightless steamer duck. As we pulled out of Port Stanley, I finally saw one running from the ship. Its legs were going and its tiny stubby wings were flapping furiously, but it wasn't making much headway. Perhaps, I speculated, they were called steamer ducks because they were so easy to catch and cook. Sadly, it was also too far away to get a decent photograph. Shortly after lunch, I attended Bruce's lecture on whales. He read a quote from the early 1800s in which a whaler had said you could count the blows from whale spouts every time you looked out over the horizon. I had not seen a blow yet. I was sad to think so many whales had died for the sole purpose of making oil for lamps and leather. Humanity had been getting light and leather treatment from other sources for centuries prior, so there was no way to justify killing whales as a matter of survival. The only explanation was that people killed whales because they wanted to. Humans have the amazing capacity to justify anything, especially if there's money to be made. Because of this, whaling is by no means an extinct trade. Then I thought about Hubert's words regarding curbing population. That night, Gunner razzed Stan for his bad weather prediction, but Stan received a complimentary drink anyhow. We were now headed toward South Georgia Island, where Shackleton and a few of his men had finally found civilization after many months of fighting the Antarctic elements. Gunner finished up the announcements. Since we're at sea for the next two days, no one will take the weather, but on the 9th we'll be at South Georgia. We will ask for a volunteer to take the weather the night of the 8th. That night was also our fellow passenger Lloyd's birthday. The dinner menu noted that the dessert was a surprise. When all the dinner plates had been collected, the hospitality crew had the port side of the galley crowd into the starboard side. The cabin lights went out and Gunner walked out with a white frosted cake topped with a huge sparkler that crackled and flashed as the court crew began to sing Happy Birthday. After the singing, we all clapped as the sparkler finally burned out in a cloud of smoke. A second later, the ship's fire alarm screeched. The captain's voice boomed out over the PA system. Fire in the galley! Report! Gunner jumped over to the hand radio fastened to the wall of the galley. False alarm! 
It's just smoke from a sparkler, no fire. We heard some barking from the captain over the handset. Gunner put the receiver down and smiled to us. Please enjoy the cake. I need to smooth things over with the captain. With that, Gunner rushed out of the room. The next day on our journey towards South Georgia Island, we circled around a microcontinent called Shag Rocks, named for the exclusive colony of blue-eyed shags, basically a species of cormorants, that lived there. A microcontinent is a piece of land that has been split off from the larger continent, Bruce explained, usually part of old continents such as Pangaea or Gondwana. Shag rocks were once part of Pangaea. According to Bruce, the shags were too far from land to live anywhere else. It was a theory that a few had been blown there, enough to start a colony. The birds ruled the jagged rocks, and there was no way to make any type of boat landing. I stayed up on the top deck when we made our 360-degree pass around the island. It was misty on our first approach, but by the time we finished our pass, the sun was out and we could see the microcontinent in detail. There were five mini mountains jutting out of the ocean, covered with 2,000 birds. It was Shag City, a.k.a. Shagopolis. As we circled the island, in a way, I felt like we were on our own microcontinent of humanity, floating along in the middle of the ocean. I felt happy to be in my new exploration micro-environment with people I enjoyed and respected. After the rocks, Bruce gave a briefing about conservation on South Georgia Island and safety around its endangered inhabitants. We saw photos of fur seal bites on people's hands. Bruce warned us to give the seals a wide berth. The males are very territorial and will chase and bite you, especially the single males, as they have more to prove. Need to give late is more like it, I thought. Only one passenger on the Molshanov has ever been bitten, Bruce continued, and luckily for him, the seal had only torn the cuff of his pants. That night I had dinner with Oscar, a poet, his wife Antoinette, an attorney, and Helena, whom everybody aboard referred to as Helena Ten Kilos. Helena was a large woman who looked to be in her early sixties and who, as she liked to explain, had been all over the world. Helena had worked hard in her youth and lived frugally, her ideal retirement was to wander the earth. Sometimes she was away for up to eight months, seeing twenty countries in that time. I can get the call the day before a trip and be asked, Do you want to go? And I will always say yes. Helena spoke slowly, with a rich Australian accent. How do you pack for an eight-month trip? Antoinette asked. I never pack more than ten kilos, and I always pack certain staples no matter where I go. Packets of sunlight to wash my clothes, skin, and hair. I have six pairs of knickers and three or four bras, depending on how I feel about myself. I used to bring cotton tails, old lady underwear, but I once roomed with a 29-year-old who had those small pennies, and I realized I could save even more weight in my packing. I traded my cotton tails for true knickers. I stared at Helena for a brief second, trying to picture her in thong underwear. The image made me burst out laughing, along with the rest of our party. So what else do you travel with? Antoinette asked. I travel with three skirts, six tops, you can double the tops for skirts, and Velcro sandals, in case the bathroom is so gross I have to shower in shoes. I like skirts because I can squat anywhere. Although, one time a man asked me the time of day as I was squatting over a pile of stones. I always have socks to cover my ankles because the Koran only says you have to cover your ankles. She paused for a sip of wine. I once got into an argument with a Muslim gentleman because he believed I had to cover more than my ankles. I assured him that I had read the Koran and that this was simply not so. Everyone laughed. I couldn't believe she could survive in a Muslim world with an attitude like that. She was certainly funny and lucky. I admired Helena for her adventurous spirit, but I wondered how much of her travel was about checking off landmarks from a list. Did she really get to know the natives? Did she appreciate them? Like Berto in Peru, or Frey Tormenta, I wanted to get to know the people who lived and worked in the countries I visited. I wanted to experience the crack of every culture I encountered. Saturday morning, I woke up and saw my first iceberg outside my porthole. I was more excited than a four-year-old on Halloween. I got dressed and ran up to the bridge. The tall first mate, Grigori, was at the helm. The colors and tones of icebergs continually changed as they drifted in and out of the fog. I'd never known there were so many shades of iridescent blue, gray, and white. I was also thankful that radar had been fine-tuned during World War II, or this would have been a much more dangerous trip. 
I had breakfast with Stan, Fabia, Don, Antoinette, and Helena, 10 kilos. Stan, Fabia, and Helena had each come aboard equipped with a personal supply of Vegemite, which they relished during every breakfast. Want to try some of Mother's milk, Sven? Stan asked, holding up his bottle. I spread some on a slice of toast. It was extremely salty and tasted more like it had a fish base instead of the barley base claimed on the jar. Vegemite is definitely an acquired taste. However, it was not as bad as the caviar paste that the Swedish cork staff ate. That stuff tasted like a fish that had been rotting on the beach for a week. If someone gave me the choice between death and Vegemite, I would eat the Vegemite. But the same demand regarding caviar paste would send me to my death. From the crew's point of view, I could understand having some comforts of home on a long journey away from all things familiar. But from a passenger's point of view, I could not understand the behavior. Travel for me is all about experiencing the unfamiliar. Comfort food could wait for my return unless I was working or my journey was more than, say, two months. After breakfast, I watched South Georgia cruise by on our port side. The island was composed of a majestic series of jagged black peaks, each with a saddle of white-blue glacier spanning the distance between. The landmass stretched from one misty horizon to the other, and if I didn't know better, I would have thought I had reached the continent of Antarctica. The sky was filled with thick, heavy gray clouds, the kind you see before a good snowstorm. When we arrived on shore, there were two small British military vessels in the water. Each was about the size of a PT boat, with a red hull and white topside. The soldiers had a tent set up northwest of our landing. Gunner gave us the familiar briefing. Don't take anything but pictures. Don't leave anything behind. Those men up the beach are military, so give them a wide berth and they'll leave us alone. The first animal I spotted was a large elephant seal pup lying next to a massive hunk of driftwood. The pup leaned back and opened its mouth to the sky, but it never barked. It just continued its silent yawn. The baby was 400 pounds, but it would grow up to be 1,200 pounds if it was a bull. The largest adult fur seals would barely hit 400. All the seals were ashore to molt and would live out at sea once they were finished. Emilio led a hike up a large hill of scree past several elephant seals. There was not much wind, and the big beasties as Agnes, a fellow passenger, liked to call them, smelled like pungent, oily musk mixed with fish. When you walk through a colony of elephant seals, it's like attending a symphony of flatulence. The pups clear their noses with short bursts of air that sound like someone passing gas. The bulls have a long, drawn-out bark that sounds like the simultaneous expulsion of belch and wet fart. We reached the top of a glacial peak and gazed to the north. This was where Shackleton had started his 36-hour hike to the Stromness whaling station, his second attempt at reaching civilization. His first attempt had been a landing at Cape Rosa, a tiny inlet near the mouth of King Hakon Bay. I looked out at the tall glacier ahead of us and marveled that this man had been out at sea almost two years before finding this hell hike ahead of him in the dead of a dark winter. I trudged back down the scree slope and gazed across the bay as a large piece of glacier calved. We heard the thundering crack of ice and the roaring sound of snow tumbling down a mountain slope. From our vantage point, it didn't appear that much ice had calved, maybe only a thousand pounds. The main glacier was at the head of the bay, and you could see fissures all along its leading edge. Each fissure would be an iceberg six to seven times larger than the Professor Molshanov once it hit the sea. The two British military boats looked like cheap bath toys puttering near the glacier's edge. When it came time to leave, we all boarded the Zodiacs and motored back to the Molshanov. The captain moved the ship about a mile and anchored off of Cape Rosa. I boarded a Zodiac piloted by Emilio, and we headed over to a tiny inlet called Cave Cove, which under normal circumstances was maybe big enough for three Zodiacs, but was now filled with a blue iceberg the size of a van. This was the first place Shackleton tried to land, Emilio reminded us. He and his men piloted the James Cairn into this little cut of rock and lived in a cave for three days. Gunner radioed to the other Zodiac drivers. We can't risk going ashore. This bird might move and block the boats in. We'll each do a single pass. I observed the shallow cave from our little Zodiac. It was about the size of a standard household refrigerator. The men must have taken turns inside the shelter. With the iceberg in the way, each Zodiac driver took turns heading into the tiny inlet. When it was our turn, I reached out and touched the blue iceberg. It was cold, wet, and smooth. Emilio continued the Shackleton story. Remember, it was May. During the Antarctic winter, the sky was dark and it was cold. It was snowing. 
The seas were rough. After spending three days huddled in the cave, the men boarded the James Cairn and made their way to our previous landing site. Gunner's voice crackled over the radio. Switching plans to a Zodiac cruise around Cape Rosa. Emilio followed Gunner through a channel of sharp rocks and icebergs as the swells picked up and rocked our little rubber boat. We reached a narrow spot where the swells were particularly large. Emilio held back and soon lost sight of Gunner. When he finally gunned the boat through the area, we were too far behind to catch up. We saw giant bergs, lots of seals, penguins, and more swells. It was beautiful. Emilio pressed further around the cape, searching for Gunner. We cruised towards a large sandy beach in the direction of Queen Maud Bay. Emilio, Emilio, what's your 20? Gunner's voice boomed out on the radio. We're drawing close to Queen Maud Bay. You're too far. You need to head back. Emilio turned us around and sped our Zodiac out around Cape Rosa. The sea grew rough. Waves crashed against the rocks and bergs, but not high enough to elicit fear. We passed a towering iceberg that resembled an Aku idol from Easter Island, only a hundred times the size. The entire berg was the color of blue windshield wiper fluid. We were the last ones to return to the ship. By the time we reached Bird Island and El Sahul for our last Zodiac cruise of the day, the sun was very low. The last cruise was pretty magical. Fur seals swam right up to our Zodiac. The bay was tall, narrow, jagged, and majestic. Macaroni penguins were everywhere, even on the cliff face 200 feet above us. El Sahul, it seemed, was nature's version of a wildlife city or condo complex. Every cove was filled with elephant seals. And at one point, we spotted a very large bull with the proper wrinkled trunk nose. He made his loud, guttural call as we passed. Who's taking the weather? Gunner asked later that evening after Helena took her beer as a reward for a good weather prediction. Lloyd, the birthday boy, raised his hand. I think we'll have rain and... The crowd booed and Gunner laughed. Someone else! Chaim, a passenger from Israel, predicted sunshine and the crowd cheered. Tomorrow we'll be splitting into two groups, Gunner announced. For those of you who are interested, you'll be joining Emilio at Fortuna Bay to follow the last part of Shackleton's journey toward rescue. You'll hike over a mountain and into a great glacier moraine valley to the Stromness Whaling Station beyond. Those of you who want something less vigorous will take a Zodiac cruise to Leaf Harbor. We will then sail to Stromness to pick up the Shackleton group and cruise the harbor there. Gunner continued. In order to fit it all in, we're having a 4.30 a.m. wake-up call. Many of the passengers groaned at this. Personally, I thought the groaning was a silly reaction. I was on vacation in one of the most unique places on Earth. I wanted to get the most out of it. I could sleep when I got home. The sun rose at four the next morning, over an hour earlier than it had when we were in the Falklands. We made our zodiac landing on a vast gray beach under an overcast and misty sky. A large colony of fur seals greeted us, the bulls whining and snorting as we hit the sand. The stench of them was overpowering. Each seal smelled like a bag of twenty damp ferrets shoved up my nose. We found patches of open sand between the firs to pass through. As we treaded lightly around them, the bulls wagged their heads, a sign that they were ready to bite. The bulls constantly looked for a fight. The breeding season was over, and there were pups everywhere. But the juveniles, who had not gotten to mate, were pissed off. They routinely lunged after king penguins, or anything they felt they could intimidate. Their behavior got old fast, and I came up with a theory. Fur seal trading had been started by the fur seals. Perhaps a long-ago Russian explorer had once set eyes on a cute, fuzzy, 450-pound fur seal bull. He approached with elation, and the bull charged him. The explorer reacted in self-defense and shot the seal. After he got over the stench, he realized that the pelt might be worth something. Maybe the fur seals owe their close call with extinction to their own unpleasant behavior. I immediately came up with a second theory. After being hunted to the brink of extinction by man, the furs are holding a grudge that will be passed down to every generation until the end of time. Once I had successfully passed the beach gauntlet of fur seals, I followed Bruce to a large king penguin colony a half mile inland through marsh, mossy ground, and rock. The colony covered the landscape as far as the eye could see. On a nearby mountain slope, a giant swath of woolly juveniles had gathered. The juveniles in our vicinity were very friendly if you stood still. The parents kept a safe distance, but were equally inquisitive. They cocked their heads and gave a sideways study with one eye. Bruce scanned the landscape with his binoculars. I can't see hatchlings. He put the binoculars down. 
I'm going in further, but you need to stay put. Can't risk anyone stepping on some eggs or a nest. I nodded. There was plenty of action right in front of my face. I stayed for a half hour watching the playful penguin youths. Tina, the ship's artist in residence, as well as Zara's girlfriend, had set up a tiny video camera and walked away. The chicks gathered around the tripod to study it. The next stop on the agenda was Pryan Island. I was on the first passenger Zodiac over. Big Sasha, one of the Russian Zodiac drivers, was piloting. Gunner had gone ahead with the staff and emergency gear to find the best landing spot for us. He had found the least populated area, but the seals were not moving, and it was clear they were intent on attack. Finally, I saw him pick up his radio. Gunner's voice crackled over Sasha's receiver. The furs won't budge. Change of plan. We're going to have a Zodiac cruise around Pryan Island. As we motored around the island, we hit choppy water. Big Sasha steered us into an inlet with a look of uncertainty on his face. He navigated further into the rocky slit, and I saw his face relax. We would be able to make it all the way back to the ship through here. Wet black rock covered in bright green moss and fur seals looked primordial, as if we had gone back a few thousand years before any human had ever set foot here. I marveled at the vast amount of animal life present. What was the world like even a hundred years ago? Every place must have been teeming with the diversity of creatures. It was beautiful to see a landscape untouched by humanity. By this time, my excitement was growing in regards to the Shackleton hike. I would be walking in his footsteps to Stromness soon. We landed at the weakest point of a fur seal gauntlet, near an abandoned sealer's cave. I made my way out and headed toward the cave, basically a four-foot hole cut in the ground. In the 1830s, sealers had been dropped here to live out a winter. During their stay, they killed fur seals and harvested pelts. The cave had been walled up back then to give the sealers more shelter. But since then, it had been knocked down except for a foot and a half lip at ground level. Ironically, a female fur seal slept inside the cave. There were no signs of the slaughter that had occurred over 150 years prior. Outside the cave lay the corpse of a reindeer, as well as a separate set of reindeer antlers. Norwegian whalers had originally imported the reindeer as a food source. The whalers were gone, but the deer had remained and flourished. Soon it was time to embark on our Shackleton hike from Fortuna Bay. I followed Emilio on his heels most of the way. The sun was very bright, the sky was clear, and I was pouring sweat. The green rubber cork-supplied boots were a handicap, offering zero traction or ankle support. As we climbed up to the ridge, I gazed back down on Fortuna Bay. There wasn't a cloud in the sky, and the Molshanov looked tiny sitting in the brilliant blue glacier water. I turned and looked up at the cut between two mountains, the route Shackleton had taken in 1916. On the other side was the now-abandoned whaling station of Stromness. We pressed on until we crested the ridge. We had reached a point above the actual mountain divide between the two sides of the island. Due south of our spot was Koenig Glacier and a small lake created by its meltwater. After a brief rest, we all headed down the other side of the range to the east side of the island. When we reached the divide itself, a lower peak blocked the view of Stromness. However, we could see a large moraine valley and the ocean beyond. We took a group photo and trudged eastward to a 400-foot-long patch of snow. Emilio navigated around it, but it was slow going. Maggie and Stefan, two newlyweds from Switzerland, had been laughing and chatting in Swiss German throughout our hike. Maggie trudged into the snow, dropped to her butt, and began to slide down the snowbank, using her boots to control her velocity. Her husband followed suit, as did I. The rest of the group followed me, and we all wound up at the bottom of the run laughing. When I reached the end of the snowbank, I could see Stromness and a tiny British Antarctic survey ship in the bay. The buildings of the abandoned whaling station were completely rusted and blended in with the sandy harbor. At one end of our stretch of snow was Shackleton Falls, a waterfall a half foot in diameter that cascaded from a peak to the north. During Shackleton's trek in 1916, it was dark, and there was ten times the snow on the ground. The falls were frozen, and the visibility so poor they could not see the whaling station which, in addition to the lack of sun, was obscured by the black smoke that resulted from melting down whale blubber. We made our way alongside the falls and headed down to the glacial valley, where we had to jump a series of streams. Different groups chose different places to make the crossing. By the time we reached the other side, our party was broken and spread out all over the moraine. Emilio and Ryan, the ship's doctor, who were picking up the rear, radioed. 
I could hear them on Bruce's device. We've taken the rest of the party to the ridge east of the Gentoos. We'll meet up here since we are too far apart to come to you. We hiked up a hill to reach their location. I was next to Imogene, a pretty 47-year-old from San Diego who was beginning to warm up to me. During our first two days, Hubert had hit on her relentlessly, but had finally eased up. Hubert was having major hip trouble, and he had stayed on the boat that afternoon. Bruce was pleased to see Gen 2 hatchlings when we reached the top. They were tiny balls of downy fuzz no bigger than a chicken egg. I was amazed to see them here, high on a ridge, a good mile from the bay. Their parents had to trek food in every day from the ocean. With no land predators, I wonder why they had made a nest so far from the water. Then again, the fur seals had infested the beaches. They didn't welcome anyone, not even their own kind. We explored for a while until it was time to head to the rendezvous point. Emilio tried to radio Gunner, but could not reach him. He checked the time and reckoned we should head down to the bay. From the ridge, I could see a large graveyard behind the whaling station. Graves that no one ever visited. Men had worked the whaling stations alone because no families were allowed, and these men had died alone in this now forgotten place. The entire Stromness area had been fenced off in 1999 by the Falkland government, which controlled South Georgia, and no one was allowed in. I could see inside the bunkhouse because an outer wall had collapsed on the west side, revealing bunk beds, bedding, clothing, tables, and chairs. It looked like the place had been inhabited and then a bomb had hit. We learned that the whalers just closed up shop one day and left almost everything behind. Cups and plates sat on tables, no need to clean up after the last meal. Clothing and whaling gear laid strewn about, being nothing the men would need in the civilized world. I found it fascinatingly eerie. We moved to a grassy area next to the beach, and I gazed through the chain-link fence at the only white-painted house in town. It was the governor's house, Shackleton's first stop to see a face belonging to someone outside his crew in two years. That structure was in much better shape than in the rest of the town, the only building with all walls and glass windows intact. The paint had peeled off the house, though, and I could see wood rot beneath. I used my camera lens to zoom in on the bunkhouse and its exposed rooms, where seals sheltered among the human relics. I noticed a few tears in the chain-link fence that allowed the seals to roam in and out of the ruins. The beach was covered in fur pups. Huge rusting propellers sat in a nearby field, spare parts for a fleet that had long been scuttled and sunk. An hour passed before the ship finally came and dropped off the Zodiacs for a second whaling station cruise for those who had gone to Leith Harbor. We were now part of the ruin, and I wondered when the hell we'd be picked up. Fur bulls gathered closer to us, nodding their heads and whining, agitating for a fight. During our final twenty minutes on shore, Emilio and Bruce used oars to intimidate a path to the water. I was relieved when the Zodiacs hit the beach and we were able to pile aboard. That night, during the recap, Dr. Ryan Smith took the weather for the next day. I was determined to take the weather after that, so I could be a part of the action and possibly impress the lovely doctor. During dinner, I sat next to Agnes from South Africa, who had been on the Leith Harbor cruise. I was appalled by the whaling stations, she said. They should be cleaned up and destroyed. The government has cleaned them up to some extent, I replied. I don't think they should erase them. They're part of history. She shook her head. You only saw Stromness. Leaf was far bigger and disgusting. There were huge whale oil drums in the water. It was a travesty, a blight on the landscape. Even if the British government had the funds, I didn't think every site should have been removed. As ugly as the whaling stations were, they were a part of history, and I felt some of them should be preserved. The next morning, we took the Zodiacs to St. Andrew's Bay the largest rookery of king penguins anywhere, with more than 330,000 birds in total. A sailing vessel was anchored in the bay, and its presence made me think of warmer waters in the harbors of Los Angeles. She had a dead reindeer tied to the stern, presumably for food. There were three British documentary filmmakers on board, whom we found on the beach several minutes later. The filmmakers were none too pleased to see our big ship full of tourists pull in. Both parties wanted the beach to themselves. Despite my own romantic infatuation, and those of the authors I read, I do not believe it is possible to be truly alone in the wild. Maybe if we explore the heavens some day. When I do catch a solitary moment, I realize no part of the wilderness has been untouched by human hands. I am saddened by the loss, but, like all things, I think we have given up the harshness previous generations had to endure when facing nature, so that we can embark on psychological exploration. The ultimate goal for humanity would be creating harmony between each other and our environment. On this beach, there were a few lone fur seal pups with no mothers around. 
I wondered if they had been abandoned or the mothers were off catching food. Skewas, carnivorous birds large enough to kill and eat a penguin chick, fought over scraps of down, and petrels patrolled the area looking for any carrion they could find. Casper used Grigory the Russian helmsman's camera to document everything. Since Grigory was shipbound, he had asked Casper to photograph South Georgia in order to show his family back in Russia. I thought it odd to record events you had not witnessed firsthand. It seemed equally odd to travel to Antarctica and never set foot outside the ship. What was the point? Then again, if I were in Grigory's shoes, I'd want a chance to witness what was happening outside my vessel, even if it was on a video screen. Bruce and I hiked to the top of a ridge to get a view of the rookery. From my vantage point, I surveyed an ocean of penguins. Patches of gray and white marked the adults, while swaths of brown identified chick congregations. To the west was a tiny one-room cabin that served as a shelter for scientists observing the penguins and seals. Two years prior, Bruce informed me, storm clouds blew in over the mountains by Cook Glacier, and the water was too rough to get the passengers off the island by Zodiac. He pointed to the coolers Gunner and team had brought to every beach landing. About twenty or so people had to wait here for eighteen hours using that tiny hundred-square-foot cabin and those supplies until the weather cleared. Wow, was my somewhat lame response. The weather here can change in a matter of minutes. It is a beautiful and harsh place to exist. I headed up a bluff overlooking a narrow river that ran down from Mount Brooker and Cook Glacier. A few hundred adult kings stood in a shallow wash. The air temperature was in the mid-forties, and they looked like they were trying to cool off. One adult had blood all down its white tuxedo originating from a deep slash at the base of its neck. Its eyes were closed as it stood in silent suffering. I wondered what it had tangled with, and if this would be its last day of life. I continued onward and spotted the three Brits from the sailboat shooting with professional video and audio equipment. They captured some good footage of a skewer walking among the kings. The skewer spread its wings, making the kings very uncomfortable. The moment I approached, the filmmakers packed up. I gave them a wide berth, but apparently a few of my fellow tourists had gotten too close earlier. The filmmakers had not been friendly. They are working down here, and probably burning up a tight budget. I shifted my attention to the kings lining either side of the river. Occasionally, one would try and cross, and would be swept away by the current, traveling thirty yards before reaching the opposite bank. The kings appeared to be having fun on a kind of natural water slide. To the north, in the direction of the ocean, there was a gully filled with woolly brown chicks. The sun was high overhead, and the line of chicks seemed to flow all the way to the ocean, as if they were a river unto themselves. I remembered something Bruce had told us. Chicks keep their down for one year. During that time, they cannot swim because the down fills with water and they drown. Because of this, they are dependent on the parents for food. That's a long time to care for a child in this harsh environment, I said. Bruce had agreed.